welcome everybody to the side event addressing the non take up of rights in the context of social protection. First, I want to thank the co organizers of the side event, the permanent mission of France to the United Nations in Geneva. Uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights and the ATD Fourth World. I also would like to thank the co-sponsors, uh, Senegal, Belgium, Romania, the Philippines. And specifically, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here today. I know everyone has a tremendously busy schedule. Um, this participation is a specific indication of how you want to bring about positive human, human rights change in our world. If you allow me, I'm gonna give a, a quick introduction of the speakers today, and then I'll, then I'll set up a little bit the, let's say the, the ground rules for the, for the side of it. Um, the first speaker will be Her Excellency, Ms. Delphine, Borian, the French ambassador for human rights. Um, she will speak in French. The second intervention is His Excellency, Mr. Cole Sec, and he's the ambassador and permanent representative of Senegal to the United Nations. The third intervention will be Professor Olivier de Schutter, and he is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. He will speak in English. The next group of inter interveners or is uh, Ms. Cecile Rio Baptista and Ms. Orfele Marel, uh, both of them from the French uh, National Consultative Commission for Human Rights. Um, the first Cecile being the Deputy Secretary General and the second Orfele, uh, the legal advisor. Fifth, and very importantly, we're joined by colleagues from ATD Fourth World, from DRC, from the Democrat, Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, the three people who will intervene are Mr. Cesar Pierre, Ms. Philomene uh, Kasige, and Mr. Saleh Abessi. So I just wanted to to, to have everyone understand the ground rules. The first three speakers have eight minutes. Then the two speakers from the French National Consultative Commission for Human Rights will share 10 minutes. And then the three speakers from ATD Fourth World from DRC will also share 10 minutes. Please accept my apologies in advance. If you run over a little than time, I will interrupt you just to say, please um, um, wrap up. So we'll have enough time for, for questions. I'll, for those of you uh, participants, as you have questions, post them to the chat and then we'll process them at the end of the inter interventions in order to create dialogue based upon, based mm -hmm. upon what you've put in the chat. Well, okay. okay, so without further ado, I think we'll, we'll, we'll move to our first intervention. Uh, Her Excellency, Ms. Delphine Borian, the French Ambassador for Human Rights. Ambassador. Merci beaucoup. Et je tiens vraiment à remercier. Thank you very much. And I would very much like to thank the special rapporteur, Olivier de Schutter, also our colleagues from Atadi. Fourth World and uh, colleagues from the Human Rights Council for taking the initiative to bring us together here today with the for the permanent representative of Senegal and others. We are right in the midst of a very dense session of the Human Rights Rights Council, and it's a great. I had the pleasure of being there earlier this week, and I'm also very happy to see that we are taking this time together to address a topic which is really so close to my heart: the fight against extreme poverty and preserving and protecting human rights. This is part of the struggle for the universalization of social protection. And now just to tell you a little anecdote, this topic is 
not new for me. In 2007, I was uh, in working for the cabinet of the president of France, Jacques Chirac, and we organized for him the uh, a large conference at the end of his mandate. And it was precisely on this topic of the universalization of social protection. That was in March 2007. As you know, France is a pioneer in terms of social security. Uh, 70 years ago, at the end of the Second World War, the National Resistance Council of France gave us key principles in terms of universality and unity. So social security is the guarantee provided to each individual, in, and in any circumstance, each individual can have the means necessary to guarantee their subsistence, their survival, and that of their families in decent conditions. So this is a text that I've just quoted from 70 years ago. And we also hear about the guarantee of ensuring that regardless of one's origin, these rights should be provided and values and rights must be protected. France has always sought to try to strengthen international mobilization in this area in order to guarantee universal access to social protection. These are measures, there are measures in place to provide an immediate response to uh, the consequences of the social of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but also in the long term, we want to ensure the resilience of populations in the face of shocks and several initiatives do indeed exist to achieve this ideal. Nevertheless, we must observe that the access to social protection is not it has not been achieved universally, and it is actually far from being achieved. In fact, before the COVID-19 pandemic, only 29% of the global population benefited from a complete social protection system, according to the definition recognized by the International Labour Organization in its recommendation 202 adopted in 2012. 55% or more than 4 billion individuals live without any form of social protection. And there are large regional disparities. The causes of this are many. The, the informal economy in many countries, the fact that there is a lack of political will in some places, there is a lack of financing and insufficient capacity for public services to take on the implementation of social protection systems. In your report, in the report presented to the Human Rights Council, you underscore a particular ph phenomenon that explains that many people that benefit from social protection, who should benefit from this, do not are not able to, and it explains why in several countries the state has indeed set up a very complete system. Nevertheless, certain categories of the population are very much isolated and do not benefit from this social protection. They are off the radar, and this may be because of stigmatization, isolation, corruption, or maybe because they turn away from the social protection systems, or maybe they don't access because they don't have the right information available. It is therefore shocking to observe that many people nowadays do not benefit from the help that has been set up for them. And your report, Mr. Rapporteur, very much underscores this in Europe and uh, tell, tells us more about France as well. Yes, we're indeed listening. So the, we must lead the struggle to ensure geographic coverage all over the world and also the universalization at social level as well. We must guarantee that nobody is left behind wherever social protection is possible. And the it's also about the legitimacy of social security. It's also about ensuring public spending and the state in, we must sure, ensure that the state, above all in Europe, is providing the right measures. And we must question when this is not the case. We have several tracks, action tracks, ensuring that we can bring people to the services, bring the, bringing the service also closer to them, fighting digital the digital divide. And France has provided itself with several tools. In 2018, France adopted a national strategy for prevention and fight against and the fight against poverty, which outlines the need for non, uh, which outlines measures, key measures in this area. Now, women 
are often left outside and left out of um, social protection systems to a dispro disproportionate degree. And this is often the case because women are often uh, disproportionately present in the informal sector. They're not covered, they're not included within social protection systems. And women are often the first to leave their jobs and leave the protection provided by that job when a child is born or when isolation occurs. And this is the case because uh, several social protection systems are not sufficiently adapted to the specific needs of women, particularly when it comes to providing care in the cases of gender violence. And often women suffer gender stereotypes. Social protection for men and women has a significant impact on their empowerment, the opportunities for women and girls to benefit. And the whole of the population should benefit. We must therefore ensure that social protection systems integrate this gender element, and they must leverage the uh, leverage and bring about the economic empowerment of women. We must also ensure that social protection systems integrate measures of protection and and uh, also fight against gender-based violence. France always repeats that gender issues are a a uh, key part of our feminist diplomacy. Uh, by 2025, 65% of the commitments undertaken in bilateral development cooperation by France has the main objective or significant objective to guarantee gender equality. Many projects set up by the French Development Agency are already part of this dynamic. I'm thinking particularly about the Mus Muscaca fund set up in 2010, which seeks to improve the health of women, newborn, and girls in West and Central Africa. We is This is a struggle that we wish to lead with you, Mr. Special Rapporteur, here at the United Nations, but also on the ground and side by side with civil society. The role of civil society is indeed incredibly crucial. The universalization of social security and the fight against gender inequality is a long process and we work on this day by day in France with all actors and in particular with those most affected. Social protection was invented in, uh, was developed in France many years ago and we work closely with you in this combat to ensure that we fight against exclusion and to ensure that the links of solidarity can stretch across borders, borders to ensure that universalization is the is a solution for those who see their rights denied from them. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, I'll now pass the uh, pass the floor to. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Kolesak, the Ambassador, Permanent Representative, Senegal to the United Nations in Geneva. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Moderateur, cher Todd. Thank you very much, Moderator. Thank you, Todd. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the French mission and also the NGO Atede Atidi fourth world for organizing this event and i'd like to also to congratulate the panelists and all those that will take the floor today i'd like to thank you all for your words and i also extend my congratulations to the special rapporteur mr olivier de Schuter, and my country supports your mandate sir we welcome the participation of her excellency delphine Borion ambassador and thank you for your words just now the topic that brings us together here today reveals a great deal about uh, the issue of non-take up of rights is essential and the complexity of the approaches that exist within bureaucracy may discourage certain people from taking up their rights and others are do not have the right information provided to them so they are not knowledgeable of the rights that are possible and sometimes people do not take up rights because they simply cannot and in terms of this, uh, the, in terms of the need to spread human rights further, spread social protection further, Senegal is working hand in hand with key partners, and we are 
organizing legal free uh, legal assistance which is free of charge to the most vulnerable the aim of this is to provide greater accessibility to local services particularly for those most deprived and above all women in situations of vulnerability the mediator of the senegalese republic also plays a fundamental role in addressing the issue of the non-take-up of rights and encourages citizens to take up their their rights as is pointed out in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This approach is founded on respect for rights and can allow for inclusive, just, fair, resilient societies, leaving no one behind. In the area of social protection, the Senegalese government wants to protect the most vulnerable layers within society, providing the right measures so as to allow individuals to adapt and also sets up a, an economic and social program which seeks to support those who are most vulnerable. These programs have been set up with the universal coverage at its heart, mobilizing communities. We also have the national program for family support. This is uh, this focuses on plurality and prosperity, leaving no one behind. The aim here is to fight against vulnerability and social exclusion, above all for families who do not have social protection, integrating their support and providing them with access to social services whilst also strengthening educational possibilities and technical possibilities. Furthermore, our country is also setting up the SESAM program, which is about aging. And this is a key challenge for uh, countries with a weak economy. We also have measures on protecting those with disabilities, and we have a charter of opportunities, which looks at the issue of access to healthcare, readaptation, financial support, support in terms of employment, and also transport for those with disabilities. There are also other possibilities for contributing to the protection of those with disabilities that reach further. The Ministry for Families since 2013 has been setting up national initiatives in terms of social prote protection, and these exist through several different programs which seek to reduce poverty, vulnerability, social exclusion by focusing on an integrated global approach and focusing on the most vulnerable categories within society. Here, I'd like to reiterate the will willingness of Senegal to work with all bodies, all institutions and actors in order to strengthen and focus on this cause which gathers us together today. And I would like to take this opportunity to offer my support to Mr. Olivier de Schutter, Special Rapporteur. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, and thank you for um, the intervention and for the efforts of Senegal in this area. Um, I'll now pass the uh, pass the floor to uh, Professor Olivier de Schutter, the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Many thanks indeed, uh, Todd. And let me first of all thank the permanent mission of France to the to the UN in Geneva, um, as well as ATD Fourth World, who have been partnering with me since the start of my mandate. Uh, but my thanks go also to the the co-sponsors of this event, um, Senegal, Belgium, uh, Romania, the, the Philippines, and, uh, and to the presentations made by uh, Ambassador Borion and uh, Ambassador Sec, which, which, which I think were extremely um, interesting, uh, already starting this collective learning that I'm trying to encourage through my, through my mandate uh, on such issues. I, I suppose I should apologize for speaking in English. As I mentioned uh, um, in the beginning, I, I do this uh, in order to have some balance between the, uh, the speakers. Um, and I'm doing this at the um, kind advice of the interpreters who are supporting us and, and whom I would like to thank uh, equally. What is the context? The context is uh, that as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, a very, very large number of countries have adopted social protection measures and social protection and its universalization as described by Ambassador Borion is again on the agenda. The ILO social protection monitor 
um, has identified some 211 countries adopting 392 social protection measures in response to COVID-19. I wonder how they do this because that's even more countries than they are in the UN, but it is a, a very impressive um, move we are seeing. 60% um, of these measures are new programs or benefits, mostly for the working age population. And that sounds really impressive. But in our study on this topic, we found that many people did not benefit from this progress. Uh, people who could not fill in online applications because they have no access to internet or have weak li digital literacy. We should recall, for example, that although worldwide some 46% of the world's population has access to internet. Um, this percentage is only 20% in Sub-Saharan Africa, 26% in South Asia. In contrast, in North America, that percentage is 78%. So as social services become online and as you need to fill in forms on, online in order to have access to certain schemes, that leaves many people out. And then people may fear contacts with social services. Um, I regularly meet people, undocumented migrants, informal workers, families in poverty, who fear that if they claim support, uh, there will be an inquiry into the household and maybe the child will be removed from the family if the child is considered at risk. In addition, we find in many countries that corruption plays a role in access to social protection, especially in healthcare provision, in access to schools, in access to means-tested cash transfer uh, programs, which depend on the, the more or less subjective assessment by social workers of how rich a family is and whether that family qualifies or not. Corruption, we should recall, is a regressive tax uh, imposed on the poor. It is more difficult for low-income households per definition to pay such a tax to have access to social services, uh, not least because typically poor household will be more frequently asked a bribe because they're politically powerless and because they're not expected to complain. So that is why we need a reality check about social protection, not to remain at the level of what the legislation provides for, but examine the very concrete obstacles that people may encounter in having access to social protection. This is why um, my team prepared a, a, a worldwide survey on the issue of non-take-up of rights. And I would like to uh, pay homage to the work of Agat Ozinski in this regard, who directed this survey. Uh, it collected some 421 responses from administrations, NGOs, academia, UN bodies, and some 258 responses from individuals covering 36 representative countries we found in this survey that the three top reasons why people do not apply for certain benefits are first of all, that the application procedure is complex. There are many bureaucratic hurdles. Individuals also may fear to apply, as I mentioned, because of their fear to be in contact with, with social services. We also found that the second reason was that beneficiaries are often unaware of the benefits they are entitled to, um, is not available in the right language, it's difficult to understand. And, and finally, even when eligible individuals know there is a benefit they may claim um, access to, they may have um, poor information about how to do this um, and how to, um, um, in fact, fill in the forms and, and claim that benefit. Sometimes individuals do apply for the benefits and they do qualify, but they do not receive the benefit. For example, because the budgets are insufficient. In Brazil, their most famous cash transfer program, Bolsa Familia, gives a, a certain amount to each municipality um, so that when the money is spent, the families that have not been supported yet will not receive any form of support. Sometimes individuals meet physical or technological barriers preventing them from receiving the benefits, they cannot uh, move to the city where the benefit can be collected, or they cannot use uh, the internet to have access uh, to, the, to the benefit. And sometimes they have no information about how they can appeal against this. 
Let me make five remarks about the lessons we learned in our study. First, stigma associated with claiming benefits rarely comes up in the survey, although we know from other studies it does play an important role in certain contexts. For example, there was a very important study on school meals programs in the UK, and very clearly, children from low-income households felt they were stigmatized if they were benefiting from this free school meal program, so they did not apply, or they applied in much smaller um, uh, quantities than expected. Uh, similarly, for unemployment benefits, people feel stigmatized when they feel they are a burden on the community and they should be able to find work. And so stigma, um, the shame of claiming certain social benefits, plays a role in non-take-up of rights. My second remark is that social services are caught in a double bind. On the one hand, of course, their role is to provide support to ensure households receive the protection they have a right to receive. On the other hand, however, increasingly, social services are gatekeepers of the system seeking to prevent fraud. Um, and in fact, um, they have few incentives to provide people in need with information about the schemes they can have access to, um, the support they can benefit from, because the dominant language is about the need to save scarce resources. It's about the need to avoid anyone cheating the system and being unjustly included. The main discourse is about the need to screen out the undeserving. And this discourse has been increasingly heard since the 1980s. We have many studies about how the media speak about poverty, showing that the, the paradigm or the fantasy of the welfare queen, for example, has emerged in public discourse over the past 40 years. Also resulting in shame and stigma from people who otherwise would be potentially able to claim certain benefits. And the social workers themselves, they would benefit from a very different approach, one which, which would see social protection not as a cost imposed on the community, not as a burden on the public budget, but quite the opposite, as an investment in people, as a condition for improved human capital and shared prosperity. My third remark is that targeting, um, especially by so-called proxy means testing to identify households in poverty, um, may be a, a source of non-taker. Of course, the targeting, which seeks to assess whether a family is wealthy enough and the income's high enough, uh, or whether the family needs to be supported, looks like a good idea because, of course, support is more effective if you target those who need it the most. However, it has a number of perverse consequences. It leads to more bureaucratic hurdles being imposed, documents having to be provided to prove eligibility. It leads to intrusive inquiries into the situation of the household, infringing on privacy rights, infringing sometimes on, on lifestyle choices. For example, when a family loses benefits because there is a second um, income earner in the family, or it may lead to under-inclusion, especially in developing countries where the administrative capacity is weak, where there's a large informal sector, where there's a relatively low registration rate of children, and where social registries are incomplete or not regularly updated. More and more scholars working on these issues tell me that where a large part of the population is in poverty and where targeting is difficult to achieve, universal support may be actually advisable, especially since it removes the stigma of claiming support and it can be more popular politically. Programs that are seen as only benefiting a small segment of the population, people in poverty, may actually be less widely popular and thus, fin thus financed less generously. This is what Walter Korpi and Joachim Palmer some 24 years ago called the paradox of redistribution, showing that universal programs may actually be better for the poor than narrowly targeted programs. My fourth remark is that a rights-based approach to social protection may help address the question of non-taker. I would like to oppose these rights-based approaches to what I would like to call charity-based approaches. 
charity-based approaches uh, to social protection um, see coverage and the level of benefits having to depend on the state of public budgets. They also uh, see benefits as granted by the state to alleviate suffering in times of crisis, but not defined as legal entitlements um, provided in domestic legislation. And many cash transfer systems that have been set up in response to the COVID-19 pandemic fall under that category. Now, in contrast, rights-based social protection means that you start with the recognition, indeed the affirmation, that the state has a duty to guarantee the human right to social security under Article 9 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And that duty extends to a duty to mobilize sufficient domestic resources by progressive taxation, by improving tax collection, by seeking international support. And it recognizes that people have legal entitlements they may claim and should be protected from discrimination and corruption in the attribution of benefits. My fifth and final remark is that participation of people in poverty is absolutely vital in order to understand the real obstacles they face and thus how to reduce these obstacles and improve the rate of take up in social protection. Participation indeed is central to the guiding principles on extreme poverty and human rights approved by the Human Rights Council in September 2012 and which we look forward to celebrating the 10th anniversary of um, in September of this year. And it is absolutely key if we want to avoid confusing um, what is legislated upon and what people effectively have access to given the conditions under which they may claim um, what they are entitled to receive. Let me conclude by saying this is a report uh, that I, I think uh, uh, contribute to a debate that is very urgent on the reality of social protection and how it can actually reach people in poverty. But my work and the work of my team will not stop with the report. We plan to organize training sessions. We plan to cooperate with the International Labour Organization and with the International Social Security Association in order to um, um, ensure that social protection administrations will be more aware of the very concrete obstacles that people encounter in having access to social protection. And we believe that they should involve people in poverty in providing that diagnosis and in identifying what, identifying what needs to be done to reduce the rates of non-take up. The objective is very simple. It is to move from paper rights to real rights in the field of social protection, and therefore to ensure social protection maximizes its potential to eradicate poverty, indeed to prevent people from falling into poverty and to reduce inequalities. Todd, I would like to thank you very much and I look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Olivier, for the very interesting results and lessons from the survey that you're doing. Now we'll move to the um, two speakers from the French National Consultative Commission on Human Rights. They're with us today because they actually adopted a, an opinion on the non-take-up of rights in March 2022. Um, we have two speakers. Again, um, Ms. Cécile uh, Rio Batista, the Deputy Secretary General, and Ms. Ophelie Marel, the legal advisor. So I think first to you, Cécile. Merci beaucoup, uh, Madame l'Ambassadrice, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur. Thank Monsieur... you very much, Ambassador. Thank you, Special Rapporteur. Thank you, Todd. And uh, I'd also like to thank the co-organizers for having invited CNCDH to take part in this side event. So as the moderator has said, we will be taking part as a there will be two of us taking part and we're going to explain a, our work on the non-take up of rights and i think our opinions will reflect some of the views that have 
already been expressed in the report of the Special Rapporteur. Firstly, I'd like to briefly present the general context and the main observations that we have been able to make, and then Ophelie will present the observations of the Commission. So the choice to work on this issue of the non-take-up of rights is really based on the fact that, uh, based on the observation that we have made, that several different actors, a variety of different actors, have pointed to the fact that a very large number of people in France have encountered difficulties in taking up their rights, in accessing those rights. And as a result of these difficulties, many people end up giving giving up and uh, they, they do not they're not able to access social protection and this uh, there are many different diverse actors here so um the cour des comptes the civil society bodies and even universities have all pointed to this and so cncdh has sought to understand the cause of this non-take up and we've also looked at how to remedy this we have carried out 13 hearings and we have carried out exchanges and discussions with experts, with associations, with institutions, with beneficiaries. And we have really been able to gain a very complete overview of the issue of non-take-up of rights in France. And we have a balanced view because on the one hand, we have the positions and the observations from beneficiaries and from associations and organizations. And we also have the positions of bodies that provide the social protection themselves. Now, one brief remark. The non uh, the issue of non-take-up of rights is addressed in a general way in the work that we carry out, and all of the observations are applied to social protection measures, in particularly in which uh, this is documented in France. And the work that we have carried out shows that for this issue of non-take-up of rights, we have to change the way in which we address this problem. The causes of non-take-up of rights should not be laid at, at the door of the beneficiaries. Often they are seen as people who are incompetent, but it's rather the contrary. We must strengthen the provisions in place for these individuals because often they are too complex and we have to underscore the fact that these procedures are not clearly thought out and designed. Therefore, for CNCDH, there, there is a systemic cause here and economic, managerial or performance issues must be addressed. And at CNCDH, we have said that the issue of non-take-up in the, the word in French is not often the right. It doesn't really allow us to think of this correctly because it's not the beneficiaries who should be taking up their rights. Really, it's people. often people have been prevented from being able to take up these rights. Therefore, we have to think about the access to rights. We have to look at how we can design social policy so as to allow this to be poss possible now. Ophelie will develop these ideas in greater depth, and she will also indicate the work that that we have carried out. And I just conclude by speaking briefly about the cost of the non-take-up of rights. Now, uh, here, maybe I'm being a bit cynical because we're talking about rights here, but uh, non-take-up has an economic impact and it's quite serious. We must underscore the fact that not being able to access rights or social protection actually exacerbates the situation that vulnerable people find themselves in. And then when the, the state tries to intervene too late, and that costs even more for the government. So we have an economic cost here, which is incredibly sizable. But there's also a social cost. Distancing people from their rights means that we, we are breaking with fragmenting society. People find themselves in a situation of inferiority. They are hindered from accessing their rights, and we find that these people no longer want to be part of society. There is a risk of social fracturing here, which is very serious. And on to the contrary, and often people are not able to access their rights, they're not able to take up rights, and that creates a, a vicious circle. And this has been shown by Nobel Prize winners. Now I will hand over to Ophelie, who will 
tell us more about the work that we have been doing at the Commission to address these issues. Thank you. So CNCDH has developed its opinion around two main axes for our recommendations. So building public policy in a different way and implementing it in a different way. So in terms of constructing public policy, CNCDH recommends that public policy is built in a different way, bringing together people, including people, and having an approach founded on human rights. We really promote the idea of changing perspective when it comes to public policy. We cannot limit ourselves to thinking that citizens have simply not understood. We should also understand the very significant role that administrative bodies play and not targeting populations correctly and uh, lack of resources for, man for managing requests. And as the special rapporteur has said, CNCDH recalls the fact that we should not turn to the to prejudice. We should uh, change our ideas and make sure that we are thinking correctly. We have to avoid the fake ideas in this area. And we often Often it is believed that there are mistakes made in, pe in people's declarations and or their uh, administrative forms. And often the procedures are so complex that people make mistakes and they are not able to receive aid that they are aid that they should have access to because they're simply not able to. And this and many people really suffer great stress in this, and therefore they do not dare to ask for their rights to be respected. They say they prefer not to make a, re a request rather than asking for rights and then finding that they are unable to access them. So CNCDH had underestimated the fact that stress is a very significant issue in terms of the non-take up of rights. So really it's about recognizing that there is the right, there should be the right to make mistakes and administrative bodies should also provide very practical elements to help people for example people uh, well legal assistance or ensuring that there is the right to mistake which is right to making mistakes which is recognized and in building public policy we have to take into account the different vulnerabilities that people may suffer and the fact that responsibilities may accumulate. So we could think about a foreign person in a situation who, who is not, uh, who does not have legal status, who, who has disabilities and suffers discrimination for a number of different reasons. And this person will not be able to take up the rights that they should. And in terms of public policy, the observation of CNCDH is that we have many issues, uh, we have many plans and strategies, we have many uh, measures, but they are not guaranteeing access to rights. And we believe in CNCDH that the measures are not enough. It's true that it's very complicated to get very precise statistics. It's very difficult to know exactly who will be targeted and how to target the right populations. But CNCDH really calls for an improvement in data gathering for the non-take up of rights and to also present evaluations with transparent overviews which also target uh, the uh, which look at the measures themselves as well as the beneficiaries so we need quantitative and qualitative work done in this area and then when it comes to implementing public policy cncdh recommends thinking about accessibility of rights the approaches that are needed and the follow-up afterwards in terms of beneficiaries, we need to rethink the access to rights and provide better information in clear language. This is absolutely fundamental. And this information should not be developed only uh, for the those requesting information, uh, requesting rights, but also the administrative bodies themselves, because often the people that working it for the government or for the for the institutions, they don't even understand all of the measures themselves. There are there's the right to housing, which is the case in France, and administrative bodies do not even propose this right to housing to families because they say that it will be too difficult for the family to fill in the forms and it's better to just give up, and that is not acceptable. The lack of information is often linked to excessive specialization at administrative bodies with, uh, with a lack of knowledge uh, not too many uh, messages being sent in too many different directions and the differences in re from one region to the next. And this causes 
problems when it comes to access to rights. So CNCDH recommends putting it, setting up easy access possibilities, for easy information for beneficiaries, but also to administrative bodies using very clear language and also allowing for legal design when it comes to legal aspects and we also recommend having a one-stop shop which is adapted to needs which is adapted to each individual applying the principles of looking at the real needs of it, the individual and when it comes to approaching beneficiaries well those who deal who provide this should adapt to the people, to the individuals that they are approaching. And we have examples of good practices in some courts, for example, the, the, uh, there is access to rights provided on the days when hearings are held on indebtedness or uh, rent payments that need to be made. They often um, have to target populations that they're not sure how to target. And often the non-take up had dropped precisely because of these hearings and these sessions that were held by these courts to inform people. And sometimes it's about simplifying and harmonizing the uh, the number of forms that there are, or having fewer forms, not asking for the same form twice, and then in ensuring that there is a central hub which allows people to turn to and to get the right information. And we have some people who have several small jobs, or maybe there's a there's a cleaning lady who works for 10 different employees employers uh, in a month, and then she doesn't know how to uh, ask for unemployment benefits. She has to um, fill in forms for each of her employer. And this can mean hundreds of forms with lots of photocopies, with lots of different proof and uh, the, and it becomes difficult to gather together all these documents. So it is incredibly necessary to simplify the bureaucracy and to renew. And and when renewals are necessary, we ask for we should ask for the documents that are only strictly necessary, not asking for duplicates of documents. Then our last recommendation is on digital access which indeed is a key aspect for guaranteeing access to rights and guaranteeing that non-take-up is considered so we are very much in favor of digitalization however we we underscore that we have to be very careful with this we cannot think that digital means are the only way to request social protection there should be forms available for a wide variety of different people and also some people only have a smartphone and so the digital platform should uh, be usable on a on a smartphone we should ensure that the that, that platforms are homogenous so not having 10 different passwords for one platform for example and then we would also ask that uh, well on the i've almost finished and uh, one French authority um, withdrew a law which was there to help people um, in terms of digital requests. And the, the, the State Council said that this couldn't be a possibility that people should, there should there only be one way of gaining access to a certain measure of social protection. And they said that digital means were not necessary, were not possible. And so we have to take into account the individual aspects of each individual and also guaranteeing access for those in uh, those with disabilities. And then one thing recommended by CNCDH is that we should also have the possibility of uh, adapting the offices to the physical needs of individuals. So someone may may not be able to access during office hours for example, and we have to take that into account. Thank you very much for your attention. And we are here at your disposal if you have any other questions on our recommendations. Thank you, um, thank you very much um, to the two uh, interveners and speakers from the French National Consultative Commission for Human Rights, and specifically for their work to base um, the response to this problem in, in human rights. Okay, now we'll move to uh, 
to three representatives from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, they're members and activists uh, from ATD Fourth World. And they provided a very interesting submission to the Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights in preparation of, of his report on the non-take-up of rights. And that uh, submission that they did was based on a contribution that they, members of ATD uh, Fourth World, um, based their submission on their own experiences and on that of, on, of others. So we have three, three uh, speakers, uh, Mr. Siza Pierre, Ms. Philomene Kasige, and Mr. Saleh Abesi. Um, you have 10 minutes um, the, the, between the three of you. Uh, over, over to you. C'est Philomène, c'est Philomène, Oui, oui, oui c'est moi. Ok, je passe oui. la parole. Ok. Bonjour tout le monde. Greetings, everybody. Nous sommes honorés, très fiers. Et très we are honored and very proud to take part in these discussions, which allow us to discuss the situation of people from different backgrounds, each individual with their own expertise and their own contributions that they can make for us. This is an excellent opportunity to speak about people who are crushed by the darkest misery. And it's a chance to speak about their initiatives in building a better world where the dignity of each human being can be respected. These discussions will focus on the problem of no non-take-up of rights, a problem that several members of our group have experienced firsthand. Unfortunately, if we uh, look in depth at this issue, we discovered that provisions and public policy consider social security a right for every Congolese, but many are not able to access these rights. In practice, these rights hardly exist. These are simply, it's simply in writing. It's simply words on, on paper, which don't help people at all. The social protection, the social protection system that exists, it is simply in writing on paper, and it only covers those who work in the formal sector, in the formal economy. The authorities, above all, and the government, and does not consider the informal economy. In our country, many people work in the informal sector. Thousands of people live off trade, that live by uh, carrying out trade in the streets. Often this is unregulated. Some people work in unregulated jobs such as porters, uh, they're employed in mines and quarries and they have no protection, no social protection. These people suffer the most, but they are the ones who benefit the least from social protection. I cannot stand up against a system that is already built. I will end up losing. I will be the loser. That's what a Atidi fourth world activist said during our discussions on institutional and social abuse. He explained this with the following words. He said, it is unwise for a hunter to engage in a fight against a lion when the hunter does not have a weapon more powerful than the lion. This is the feeling that people who are eligible for social services do not receive them, do not access them. 
they feel powerless, they feel humiliated. This situation is a very complex one in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and also in other African states. And it is certainly a complex issue in other countries around the world where efforts still need to be made to bring about positive change and to make the voices of isolated people, those crushed by silence and those in great precarity, that these voices must be heard. Several things can be the cause of this silence, the non-take-up of rights. We could, it is still called, this aspect is still called uh, non-take-up and often people fear that they will be fired or they lack knowledge, the knowledge necessary for social benefits or there are, there is corruption sometimes, there is a lack of, there, there's the absence of the state when it comes to monitoring and monitoring the activities of companies, there is a lack of social policies and adequate strategies to listen to citizens, to hear their suffering and to provide sustainable solutions. A long procedure there may be long procedures at the time of application as well. One member shared with us his experience with the company sub subcontract who was working with a brewery in our area. He said, I was called by my superior to sign the termination of my contract for a made up reasons. It was lies invented by my boss to get me out of this, the job after 16 years of service. And this was simply because he wanted to hire someone he got on well with. And this was inhumane because I had not received any uh, exit allowances. I hadn't received the pay for the last month. I hadn't received the redundancy payment. And uh, yet I was entitled to all of this. I filed a complaint with the Labour Inspectorate a few days later, but strangely enough, it was the, instead of the Labour Inspector, in, instead of the Labour Inspector, I found that I was called upon by the Public Prosecutor's Office, who then gave me a summons. The Inspector had received a sum of money to end the case. The Magistrate had also received money to influence me to make arrangements with the company. Last year, during the service, the, sorry, last year during the survey on non-take-up, we discovered that this phenomenon is frequently and harshly experienced. And it's not just, this is not just the case in private companies. It is also the case work for those working for the government. One woman told us about the suffering she experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. She said, my contract with the road authorities gives me the right to receive housing. I, well, each month I am made to pay the equivalent of 40 US dollars when I'm not supposed to have to pay this. This is money that our superiors distribute among themselves. It is money that does not go into the state coffers. They share the money out among themselves. We have a union in the camp, but it works with the central office and doesn't provide any help for us at all. We're talking here about two concrete testimonies, but there are many other citizens who are going through the same tragedies and they are suffering in absolute silence. They cannot make complaints because they have to protect their own job first and foremost. The phenomenon of non-take-up has a very serious impact, as we said earlier. Financially, we're not able to, people are not able to meet their basic needs, such as health care, food security, putting their children in school. And this is very difficult for families living in very serious conditions of poverty. People are often unstable in terms of their emotions. People are, uh, are not respected, they are neglected, and it seems that they've lost all value. Socially, when you're hit by all the consequences of non-take-up, you lose your friends and relatives. Sometimes you are scorned. Sometimes people point their fingers at you time and time again. During the period when COVID-19 was still killing many people, during the time when 
there were restrictions on movements, the central government made water and electricity free. This, uh, it was made free of charge for people. This was a decision that benefited a small section of our community. Only those who had running water in their homes were the ones who did not have to pay their water bill during this period. Those who did not have running water at home received no benefit at all. In order to put an end to the phenomenon of non take up and its effects, we need collective serious mobilization that takes into account the ideas and aspirations of all citizens. Here are two principles that should guide us and inspire us, each of us in our own way. All people should be treated equally and with equal dignity. Those most mired in poverty, those whose voices are rarely heard, should be placed at the center of social policies and strategies to combat extreme poverty. At ATD Fourth World, these two values really uh, chime with us. They are at our core, and we are convinced that it is only by thinking together, by offering all citizens the same opportunities, it's only in this way that we can build a new humanity and a better world for all. We would like to wrap up this speech with some words from Father Joseph Rezinski, the man who put us on the right path. He said that we must know how to reflect upon uh, the experiences of those in greatest poverty. It is not an idea that we have, we have to think about them, their experience, their day-to-day -day experiences. Thank you very much. I wanna thank the three interventions and speakers from ATD Fourth World from DRC Congo. Uh, before we move to, to the questions, I just wanted to, to highlight a couple of things said by, by speakers as we move through, because it was a, a thread that I think was very important that was developed in different ways by the, the speakers. Um, Starting with the, the French ambassador for human rights, um, indicating a concern uh, of the French government of the non-take-up of rights, um, looking at issues of, of stigma, but specifically taking on the responsibility to find why people aren't taking on these rights. And, and that really is important from a human rights perspective in terms of looking at the question of going deeper. And I think that's extremely important. Then the, the second intervention from, from the uh, ambassador um, to the United Nations in Geneva, I think what was very important was the link he made between solidarity and prosperity. And the idea that this is an investment in our shared future and the importance of access of uh, individuals that have been left behind in vulnerable groups. Then um, Professor De Schutter, in terms of um, his approach of collaborative learning, I think that the survey is very interesting in terms of how do we begin to understand as the United Nations, how do we actually contribute to resolving this problem? And I think that um, you know, the, the survey was extremely interesting because it shows you know, the complexity of application processes alone can be discouraging and prevent people from, from, from uh, let's say, realizing their rights. The fact that people are unaware of the existence of benefits and possibilities of exercising their rights. And then there's also poor information in terms of how to apply. I think the five lessons from the report are extremely useful in terms of you know, what is the problem and how do we move forward? But again, the idea that human rights provides a useful, let's say, guardrail to improving the situation and to overcoming um, some of the realities that are there. I think also the, the fact that, that one, I think governments need to consider the idea of universal support because it might actually end up with a more effective um, response. 
I think then moving to the French National Consultative Commission, I think this was extremely important, the work that they've been doing, taking, let's say, the national policy of, of, of targeting people that have been left behind and digging down deeper in terms of, you know, why this is happening. And I think that, you know, the, a couple of very important points were made in terms of, you know, we, we have to understand the realities of the people left behind. We have to understand and provide means of participation so that we can, we can see why this isn't working. And the tie to that in terms of, you know, if we don't do that, there's a cost both to the government and to society. The idea that these are rights relates to the fact that these are useful investments to creating stable, resilient societies. And I think time and time again, studies show it. But oftentimes, political ideology undermines our ability to get there. So I think that the, the intervention here was extremely important in terms of showing in various circumstances how you base uh, a response in human rights to overcome the, the, the challenges uh, of non-response or non-take-up. And then I think finally, and I think very appropriately, um, the interventions from, from the Democratic Republic of Congo from the activists. I think they bring us back to the, to the reality that everyone has something to contribute. And that when we don't actually see that and we don't facilitate that, we have a problem. And I think too, the, the, the contradiction between rights on paper and rights in reality. And that's something that we see all too often and we see it globally. I think too, the, the specific experiences in terms of people feeling humiliated, fear, corruption, the, the possibility of some type of sanction means that they don't take up their rights. And so we need to figure out how do we actually overcome that? And then finally, the idea that all citizens have to be given the same chance to advance to create the type of society we want to live in. So I wanna thank all of the, all of the, the speakers because I think together it really creates a nice mosaic in terms of where we need to go uh, on this issue. So I think with that, we'll move to the, the questions. And I think um, Anne is going to, to help me, I think with the first couple of questions. Uh, Anne, do you have, sure. I don't see your- Sure, I can. There you are. Well, let me start my video. Voila, and I'm gonna change the view so that everyone can see each other. Um, I think, um, I mean, there's a couple of questions asked, but maybe let's ask um, one that I find particularly interesting. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say it in French, just for the interpreters already, I'm just going to read it. Pourquoi le rapport spécial, le rapporteur spécial parle de non-recours? Why does the the rapporteur the special rapporteur talk about um non take up when it shows that people try to have a take up but it's a, it's it's an issue on the the denomination of non take up if you agree um, i can pick up that one because it's in fact a question addressed to uh, to me uh, related to the title of the report and uh, the the, the wording or the vocabulary used to describe the phenomenon, which of course is a phenomenon uh, specialists in social policy have been describing for four years now, and they use the word non take up, non recours au droit to describe it. But I do see where the question comes from. It is absolutely true, as uh, the adjunct uh, secretary general of the Commission Nationale Consultative des Droits de l'Homme, uh, Cécile Rio, mentioned, it is. Um, misleading because it suggests that the reason for uh, people not having access to social protection is because they just are not interested and should they want to have access uh, they should uh, in principle not face any difficulties so the reason why access to social protection is insufficient is because of the choice made by a person uh, who is making a calculation that is that it is too costly to have access to, to the scheme in comparison to the benefits that uh, can be obtained. And I think 
we have to put um, no recours, non take up between brackets in order precisely to ensure that the design of the scheme, the way it is applied by the social services, the kind of information that is provided and the kind of uh, uh, layers of administrative hurdles that are imposed in order to have access um, are, not, uh, are not underestimated. That is why people, if they do choose not to exercise their rights, um, 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 do not have access to social protection. So I, I thank uh, this, uh, the author of this question. I think it's, it, it points to some hypocrisy in the way we look at the issue, which uh, reflects in the vocabulary that is in use in this area. Thank you. Well, do you want me to ask another question? No, what I thought I would do here is that we would go to one that I think um, uh, everyone can respond to, which relates to the importance of legal clinics and support um, relative to challenging or to overcoming the non-take up of, of rights. Because I think everyone in the panel um, has something to say about this. And in fact, yesterday, um, I was speaking to my, my team, indicating that um, we actually were going to have a meeting with, uh, with India um, because they're moving more toward a, a process of um, smartphone applications, but they have lots and lots of people that don't have access. And we were also talking about the fact that you had a real challenge in terms of accompaniment. You know, how do people actually apply for benefits? How do we get there? And so we were going to have that discussion with them with the concern that I think people had brought up here. And I think the, the ambassador and permanent representative to the United of Senegal to the United Nations in Geneva brought up the issue of, of legal clinics um, and the importance of creating that type of, of accompaniment. So I would like to, to bring this question actually to all panelists. Please be brief because we have a number of questions but that if we could just um, start in the same order as we did, and then next time we'll start in the opposite order if there's a question that goes to everyone. So first over to you, uh, Ambassador Bautian. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, the debate and really, uh, pardon, je, je remercie vraiment tous les intervenants qui uh, ont apporté à chacun. Thank you to all the speakers here who have given us a very interesting insight. They've given us very specific information on why this phenomenon occurs. And it's true that in France, we have indeed adopted this national prevention strategy and uh, for combating poverty and which uh, seeks zero non-take-up. And uh, it's really about looking at social and economic rights as we were hearing from CNCDH is the fact that depriving individuals from of their rights and uh, mean and preventing them from having resilience that means that they can very quickly plunge into a situation of poverty which they're not able to escape from and they may have an incident in their life or maybe they have a health problem or maybe uh, they have an accident or something and the poverty trap then it grabs them and pulls them in. And so it's in, it's about having access to all social benefits. That's very important. And maybe a historic comparison. It's very interesting to see that development in industrialized countries in Europe at the end of the 19th century, that was actually accompanied by these social protection measures or at least at the start the the early phases of the social protection schemes and that's very important for development of the whole of the country and i'll leave it there thank you very much ambassador sir Merci beaucoup. Les débats sont extrêmement importants. Thank you very much. These are very rich discussions now as for the question that was initially brought up for me, the terminology is very important, and the main issue here is that there's one observation that citizens who have the possibility of accessing justice, sometimes they're not able to do this, and once um, 
observations are made, all of the uh, stakeholders, civil society, and institutions should be able to put the right conditions in place so that any citizen who wants can access justice. Now, we maybe you have the means to access, but maybe you don't want to, and that may be for one reason or another. But I think what is important is that we have to have this approach in Senegal. We have to have the right approach here. The issue of non-take up, that really goes back a long time. And I think uh, it's about social issues, uh, disputes with the state, for example. Now, in uh, the institutions are not developed correctly in my country because non-take up is not addressed correctly. And we have to speak about the situation of people's rights. Now, we want to work in favor of awareness raising. We need to uh, work with women legal experts who can help us to develop the right spirit of getting access to rights, having take up of rights correctly. So really we need to encourage people, but the state has to be there as well. That's our, that's the, it's the state's responsibility first and foremost to ensure that citizens have take up. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, uh, Todd. Je vais, je vais répondre en français pour varier. Thank you very much. I'll answer in French to, just to vary the languages a little bit. So, um, so among the most concrete recommendations we've heard and among them, there, there are some concrete ideas. So, for example, providing justice for the most impoverished, as we were hearing in Senegal, these experiences these suggestions are thanks to the fact that we listen to those in poverty and Philippe Marel for the national consultative body speaks about the uh, timetables of the offices uh, and having access to online forms and then the ambiguities of digitalizing public services. I think all of these are issues that administrative bodies do not want to solve because the, those in poverty are not helping to diagnose the problems. So I would reiterate our call. I would say we need to find solutions for this non-take up by bringing those in poverty forward and raising their voices because otherwise there are, uh, well, there are actually very cheap solutions which we are forgetting about. Thank you very much. Very good. Uh, I think to Cécile and Orphele. Merci beaucoup. Alors, très brièvement pour rebondir sur ce que... Thank you very much. Now, just to uh, go uh, to respond to what Mr. De Schutter was saying there. So, one fundamental issue is that uh, there's the importance of building public policy, ensuring that public policy is developed and uh, really basing ourselves on human rights because one of the main principles of human rights is co-construction, co-evaluation, doing things jointly with beneficiaries, bringing beneficiaries into the way in which we think about public policy. And this human rights, this human rights based approach means that we can have we try to reduce non-take up as much as possible and we can have social policies, social services, which are really thought out for the people that they are targeting and they have to be truly effective. And so it's very important to remember this now, remember this approach. Yes, to, to keep going on this idea is that we really want to um, construct the policy in another way. Uh, here, our work was really to insist on the fact that we need to, to think this, to create this uh, with really the, the welcoming the, the people who live in poverty in mind. Uh, we heard some examples when uh, in the, the, the people who would welcome them, the civil servants, would have a timer to welcome someone. And after five minutes, uh, it rings. And then everyone in that case is in a situation of stress. And then if someone comes 
here with a number of, of documents uh, in, in a plastic bag that is not sorted out, uh, the, the person who is welcoming that person has to uh, reply to a certain number of people in the same day. She will, they will say, please come back or your file is not uh, complete. And this person who came here will maybe not want to come back saying, uh, thinking that they don't have what it takes. Uh, what it, so this is what leads to an on-take up situation. So we need to think really in a, in a, in a, in, in a complete way um, to really rethink the way that we welcome people as well as from the administrative side. Thank you. Uh, now over to Philomene, um, Sisa and Saleh. Yes, uh, above everything that's been said, it's, it's really interesting to, to hear everything that you've been said, that's been said. But for us, we really think that the non-take-up of rights are just words. They, they are ways of naming. Uh, someone said that before, but the, the most important are the facts because this exists in society. We feel that there is a part of society who do, who do not have access to all the advantages, to all the, the, the services of, um, of, of rights. And that's why we need to have uh, an exhaustive approach and we need to take everyone into account, especially the people who live and who experience extreme poverty. So yes, it's good to think and rethink the, the social policies, um, uh, and how to, to have access to uh, the benefits from uh, social programs. But it's really important to include the most isolated people. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. And so, uh, Anne, why don't you uh, present the next question, please? Sure. Um... I will go for uh, Janet Nelson's question, which is, what are the financial implications of universal access to social protection benefits in comparison to the current systems based on targeting? In this particular case, um, does, do we have any volunteers to respond to, uh, to this? And thank you, Orphile, for, for being with us. Any, anyone want to respond to this question? I, well, I, I think first and foremost, before we, we, we hand the floor to Professor Deschuter and, and Ambassador Sec, um, I think it's important that, that the speakers highlighted that these are investments and investments in a society to create the type of society that we want to create based on the, you know, the vision of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So oftentimes it's important to see how we construct the question and how we, how we respond to it. So I guess uh, uh, Professor Deschuter and then to Ambassador Sec. Um, many thanks. I would like to make in response uh, perhaps three remarks very briefly. First, we should avoid opposing two strongly targeting uh, or targeted schemes on one hand and universal schemes on the other hand. Um, we can have many hybrids and targeted universalism would mean, for example, that all have access to certain benefits, um, for example, child allowances, but those families that have lower incomes may have a higher level of support than those who have higher incomes. Um, um, and so the right question is not targeting versus universalism. It is um, what um, degree of um, indexation of support on the situation of the family concern. That's number one. Number two, um, it's important to realize that um, it, although it may be costly to protect all the population and although some households may not need uh, to, for example, receive child allowances or housing allowances, um, paradoxically, 
it may be much easier to fund universal programs simply because the support within the population uh, will be easier to get. And uh, taxpayers' money will be um, um, easier to collect in uh, support of universal schemes. Think of healthcare, think of education. These are universal social services that are extremely popular that no government would dare to remove uh, because it has such a strong support from the middle class. And of course they are costly, but they create a sense of social cohesion and unity and solidarity that is extremely precious to maintain and indeed um, to um, re-inject in, in current discussions. And my third point, uh, Todd, simply uh, repeats what you said. I think what may look like a cost in the short term, in the long term, has in very important multiplier effects, allowing inclusive growth and the building of human capital that are vital for the sustainable uh, 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 trajectory of our societies. And there are many studies on child allowances, for example, that show that the returns on investment are very high, not within six months, not within a year, but within five, 10, 15 years, absolutely. And these returns are extremely high. It is frankly the best investment a society can make. Many thanks. Ambassador Sack. Merci beaucoup. Je pense que... Uh, Thank you very much. I think uh, universal access is a responsibility from the state. Uh, as I said, we need to have commissions for um, citizens to have access to uh, basic social services, to protection. Uh, but of course, uh, it doesn't happen uh, as we would like it to happen. And not always in, in all uh, countries uh, in the United States, for example, we ha they have the same problems as we have in our countries. So it's not a question of big countries or not. We need to have the willpower to put this into place uh, and to make sure that uh, the citizen have access to these services, whether they know about it or not, whether they can access to it or not. Uh, and it's not a question of developed countries or not. Because even in the, the most developed countries, uh, there are uh, places where if you don't have a lawyer, you can't claim your rights. And some people do not have the money to have a lawyer. So we need to think of how we can make sure that um, every citizen can access the services that even the services that are costly in some countries. Of course, context can change. Uh, in my country, in Senegal, there is a new law that will be put into place uh, that allows everyone to have a lawyer as soon as you need it. Um, this allows the, the, the citizen to know their rights and to claim their rights, uh, to enjoy their rights. So, the, of course, there are many different situations uh, where we have to put into place systems, including civil society, because of course the state cannot do everything, but we need to, to, to require the help, uh, to use the help of civil society, of NGOs, to make sure that uh, independent mechanism as well can work into the systems and to allow citizens to have access to um, a, a set of, uh, of basic services to make sure that they can enjoy their rights. Thank you, Ambassador. And I just wanted to say there's a few more questions. Perhaps we could take um, two more, even though I know time is out. And so uh, I, I wonder if we could take another five to 10 minutes of your time, given the fact that there was, uh, and there still are a number of people participating. And if you do have to leave, we certainly would understand it. But let's just take the, there's two questions that I think we'll take. Um, one relates to the definition of citizen. I think it's an extremely important question in terms of, you know, for, uh, you know, one of the, I think one of the important issues is uh, when we talk about a human rights approach, um, we talk about human beings. We don't necessarily talk about citizens or migrants, but it is a very important issue for us in terms of how do we uh, respond to people that don't have status, and are we are we including them when we talk about 
um, this issue of, of um, non take up. So I, I think I would appreciate if, if people would volunteer to, to respond to this question. Ambassador Sec. For me, it's a question of the law. To me, this is a question that is quite complex uh, because in my work as an ambassador, I am in charge of, of um, consulate affairs and I see a lot of people who are in a situation uh, that is irregular in a country that have to take up their rights Uh, and they are being told that uh, their rights don't exist because they are uh, in, a, in a situation that is irregular. And we ask them to just leave. And these are situations that are very concrete and we have thousands of, of those um, in, in the countries that we are in. And the main thing here is that when we deal with these uh, with such cases we need the states to make sure that we are inclusive uh, that the the status whether it's legal or illegal do not impact the the fact that the people can enjoy their rights and they should have um, they should enjoy their rights and then later on we could think of whether the, they are in a legal or illegal situation but uh, the status should not determine their access to rights. Thank you. Ambassador Borian and then Ceci. Um, merci beaucoup et, et merci encore pour ce débat uh, uh, très important. Thank you very much and thank you for this important discussion. As we just heard from Ambassador Sec, we're, it's really about human rights and we're at the Human Rights Council and it's the, the multidimensional issue of human rights that is important. We need to have all of these rights taken into account and they must be promoted. And when we speak about citizens, I'd say that there's also, well, of course, rights have to be accessible to all citizens, but sometimes we may think about, well, for some citizens, fundamental rights, fundamental needs need to be provided for and in France for those in France but who may not necessarily have a residency a residency permit um, we have at least basic health care provided and and social services are available to them basic social services for children for the elderly for uh any emergencies and so we do provide to we do seek to provide these basic services to all individuals and it is uh, really about human rights and now we're coming to the end of this discussion so i just wanted to mention another issue regarding the social protection systems and we should underscore that, that there is a huge amount of diversity when it comes to these social protection schemes each country may have their own system, which uh, is uh, suited to its social, economic culture. But it's also important that all of these systems can coexist so as to respond to the different needs. There's not one single model. There's not one. It's not a one size fits all approach. Thank you. Oui, merci. En fait, je, 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 je Thank rejoins... you very much. So I would echo what was said by the ambassador just now for CNCDH. It's very important that, well, this issue of access to rights, it's important that people have access to certain social services, and this goes beyond citizenship or nationality or your administrative status in France. Indeed, we do have some measures some provisions which are targeted for those in those who have a legal status and the idea is to provide minimum access to health care to housing to education and that cncdh we 
plead fiercely for these provisions to be implemented correctly so that they can be added to as well and there is the well those who are the beneficiaries of these social services can be from a where from very broad backgrounds and we have a real inclusive approach here and we believe that regardless of the administrative status of the individual well, well there's really an issue of dignity it's an issue of human rights and so people should have all people should have access to minimum social services thank you so i think what we'll do now is we'll take one more question from Anne, and as part of this you can also do your wrap-up in terms of each of you We'd encourage to respond to the question and then also to, to give your final thoughts um, relative to the panel and we'll close with, with, and so you can answer the question or you could just simply give your um, final remarks. And over to you. Thank you, Todd. Uh, alors, pour finir, uh, je prends la question d'Antoine. C'est, et c'est la suivante. I'll take the question of Antoine, which is the following. Um, those who are affected by poverty maybe are not able to access rights and this issue also is part of it uh, is important in terms of social services and we should ensure widespread coverage. Yes, merci. Thank you very much. So I think the answer was also mentioned in the discussion earlier that we have to ensure that these mechanisms, the provisions have to be organized, but not only for the people, but with the people. And we have to ensure that the beneficiaries are listened to. We have to have our ear to the ground so as to know the limitations that, that exist, as were mentioned by our friends from ATD Fourth World in the Congo, also CNCDH and the Special Rapporteur. So it's working with people so as to ensure that we can meet their needs. And uh, the it is a very long path to respond to these needs. And then uh, the digital divide and the fact that Elderly people have difficulties because many uh, platforms are digitalized. And then on women, we haven't spoken about women a great deal, but this is very important because often women are discriminated against or they have even less access. They have less take up when it comes to social services and social protection. So we should take women into account when defining programs, when providing access, when making, when enabling their access. It's important for women, but it's also important for the whole of society. Thank you very much. And thank you once again to this discussion. Thanks very much. Actually, I'll change the order at the very end. I think we, we'll go to uh, our, to um, ATD from, from DRC, and then we'll go to Cecile, to Ambassador Sec, and then we'll, we'll end with Olivia. So over to you uh, for your concluding words from, from, from DRC. Thank you very much once again for giving us the floor. So as for the last question, which was put to us, well, like uh, similarly to the previous speakers, there are some aspects which were mentioned in the discussions and in the presentations. And uh, we believe that it's very important that those living in a situation of poverty are listened to. And above all, those who are the beneficiaries of social services should be the ones that we listen to. And I think that we should not just consider this as an approach or as a methodology. It's not that. It's really looking at this as a duty, as something that we are bound to do. Uh, we have to 
allow these people, allow beneficiaries not to feel like beneficiaries and just that they should be seen as real participants and stakeholders. And then this issue of participation is very important within the international movement of ATD Fourth World. We speak about strengthening knowledge spread and sharing knowledge. It's about putting things into practice. It's about thinking, seeing society, envisaging society with the views of all with contributions from professionals, from those who are on the ground, those who are in contact with beneficiaries, those who live in difficult conditions. And this contribution, it's about the knowledge that we can draw from the daily lives of families living in poverty. It's very important to take this into account. So really with, it's about, bringing together professionals, uh, those in government, those living in a situation of poverty, building a team that can uh, then promote interesting projects which can actually adequately respond to the needs and the issues in our society. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for having allowed us to have this discussion, to take part and to listen to others through this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Cecile, then we'll go to Ambassador Sack. Merci. Alors, je, 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 je partage totalement... Thank you very much. So, yes, I fully share what was said by the previous two speakers. I would also like to stress that working with people, that means working with everybody, so beneficiaries, but also working with policy makers with legislators the lawmakers and also working with those who have the task of implementing public policy and so when you have a, a phenomenon the cause of which is systemic we may say the system is not suited to the beneficiaries but also it's not suited for those who actually are there whose job it is to apply the measures and in uh, there's a certain unease in france among those who work for social service providers, for the employment office, for social protection services, because, well, really, it's about bringing everyone together around the table and thinking how we can actually do things properly. And in France, at a day, Fourth World has developed training schemes with uh, some training institutions to focus on this. And this is training which really does bring together beneficiaries, those living in situations of poverty and in serious poverty, and also working with future civil servants, future officials and the authorities. And so really is ensuring this can guarantee for better implementation of social policy. And as we were hearing in the question, I do indeed believe that we have to uh, go back and appreciate the full value of what can be done financially and we have to appreciate solidarity efforts and that means we're placing the human being at the core of social policy and it means that we're placing the human being at the center of society so i would really like to thank all of you for the quality of this discussion i have found this incredibly interesting and I've learned many things which can really feed into our work at CNCDH in the future. And thank you very much to the co-organizers for having invited us. Merci Todd, merci pour ces échanges. Je félicite vraiment tous les intervenants ATD. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank ATD Fourth World. Thank you for your relevant views there. And I think that um, I think that we can all continue to grow um, and we need to work together and we need the I we need the ideal approach there this approach is not easy but we can work in synergy with government with civil society with institutions and we can really ensure that those that we want to serve are included in this ideal and we have 
well, we may see steps back, we may see the problems arising, that can happen anywhere in the world. But the important thing is that the with the work that we do, we can use the report, use the outcomes and have decisive action, which can act as a good example for other countries. So it's really about highlighting the good practices around the world. And in this way, other countries can see they can make reference to this and that way we can work towards this great ideal and this for what we want to help humanity and to help the human dignity of each individual. Thank you. Thank you very much, Todd. Uh, very briefly to, to conclude. First, thank you to Antoine Roth for his question. Odenor, which is the research team which he is leading, is doing fantastic work on non-take-up of rights in France and abroad. I, I, I think that should be really um, uh, paid, paid homage to. Uh, on the question he raises, I think we have to realize that social workers, public services, uh, are actually victims of a system in which um, legislation is incredibly complex, fast changing, making, making it very difficult for them to give uh, appropriate advice and sometimes contradictory. We had recently um, a, 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 an event with ATD Fourth World around the Revenu de Solidarité Active, the minimum income scheme in France. And one person in poverty was telling us she has a car. And on the one hand, she was receiving the advice that she should, she should sell the car in order to be able to continue to receive the minimum income scheme because she had to liquidate her assets. On the other hand, she was told, no, no, she should keep the car because that is one way she can be able to uh, travel to work if indeed um, there is a work opportunity that shows up. And so these contradictions put social workers in a very difficult condition and they are caught between their um, duty and expectation that they will provide aid. And on the other hand, the discourse about reducing costs, about um, 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 not being too generous, avoiding including people in the schemes that might not be worthy of being supported. And that tension is one that creates lots of uh, suffering and, uh, and, and uh, makes their work particularly difficult. So I, I thank Antoine for emphasizing this. Let me close by thanking my, my team for the superb support they provide me. And, and let me thank you, Todd, for leading this discussion so well and allowing us to go over time. I think it was extremely rich and dense. We all learned a lot. It's the model of what we should do in order to make progress towards social protection. Thank you. Well, thank you, Olivier. And I wanna thank all the participants. It's been a very active, you can see on the chat, uh, the, the level of, of activity. And I wanna thank the, um, the panelists. I know it's, uh, it's a lot for everyone to prepare and to do what they need to do, um, but I really do wanna thank everyone, the panelists for, for their interventions today and more for their work, because I think each and every one of you is contributing in one way to improving the situation and to increase the level of respect for human rights that we see in the world. So with that, I wanna thank everyone and, and have a good rest of the day. Merci beaucoup à tous. Thank you. Merci, merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci, 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 merci,